Mason uh, magnetic stripes. This is one of the most important data sets ever collected in marine geophysics. This is the place where magnetic stripes on the seafloor were discovered. This was back in the mid-1950s, before seafloor spreading, before plate tectonics, and the uh, Roth and Mason who contoured these noticed that there were some uh, offsets in these uh, anomalies. And this wasn't a problem because nobody even knew these uh, stripes should be there, so nobody worried about these stripes. And we didn't start worrying about some of these features until later when Fred Vine correlated these stripes with the magnetic reversal time scale. Uh, he and Tuzo Wilson recognized that there were ridges and a transform fault. Plate tectonics was discovered. And at that point, some of these features became more puzzling with the discovery of plate tectonics because, as you all know, plate tectonics is very good at explaining things that are parallel and perpendicular to plate motions and very bad at explaining things that are oblique to plate motions. And so these uh, offsets in the magnetic anomalies that uh, everyone interpreted as faults uh, were very puzzling in terms of plate tectonics. And two schools of thought uh, arose. One said, these uh, faults show relative plate motion. These are strike-slip faults. They offset the magnetic anomalies. This means that there are lots of plates in this area, lots of little microplates moving relative to each other, and they're moving uh, along those trajectories. And that's the explanation for those faults. The other school of thought said, no, uh, plate tectonics doesn't work here. This Juan de Fuca plate is very young. It's uh, warm and weak. It's impinging on North America. It's unreasonable that rigid plate tectonics should hold. And these faults show the deformation of the plate as it uh, runs into North America. The correct explanation for these uh, features didn't occur to me until many years later when I was working on what I thought was another problem in another part of the world. And that is, they're not faults at all. I was working in the Galapagos area, and I was working on the problem of ridge jumps. Uh, these are magnetic anomalies. They look upside down to you because they're on an east-west ridge near the magnetic equator. For you geologists, north is uh, to the left. Galapagos Islands are over here. And here you can see these are what the anomalies should look like if nothing interesting is going on, just symmetric spreading. And you can see three million years ago there was no transform fault in this area. Today there was, or at least this was my original interpretation. Uh, this wasn't supposed to happen. This is one reason that you study plate tectonics, so you recognize anomalies. Tuzo Wilson, when he defined transform faults, said they're formed when continents break up. The geometry never changes. This was not allowed to happen in terms of classic plate tectonics, but it was happening. So something interesting was going on here, and so I was uh, working on this as part of my PhD work. When you think about what, what's going on, the ridge was in one place, and now the ridge is jumping to a new place. And when you consider what, what has to happen, it's sort of puzzling the Earth would go to all this work. Here you have a very schematic ridge, two lithospheric plates moving apart, a sphenosphere rising to fill the gap. Uh, this should be steady state because uh, the extreme temperature dependence of rock strength. This is the hottest place, the thinnest, the weakest. Once you have a geometry like this, it should stay like that. Instead, this was happening. Uh, some lithosphere was being transferred from one plate to another. This plate was either fracturing or melting through to transfer that lithosphere. The plumbing system had to be uh, changed so to bring a sphenosphere up to a new place. Why is the Earth going to all this trouble? Why on Earth should something like this happen? I didn't know. But it turns out that just the recognition of these spreading center jumps was uh, sufficient to resolve a big problem with the Galapagos as a hotspot. Uh, many people have written papers saying the Galapagos can't be a hotspot because there was seemingly uh, fatal geometric objection to this idea. And it turned out these jumps and the asymmetric accretion that they resulted in were exactly what was needed to resolve that uh, problem with the Galapagos. And so I uh, did my PhD thesis, showed the Galapagos could be a hotspot. Just parenthetically, I came out to Hawaii to give a talk and said, good news, Galapagos can be a hot spot just like Hawaii. And the uh, faculty here rose up unanimously and enthusiastically and said, Hawaii's not a hot spot. <laughs> but uh, later, uh, they've, they've uh, come around. Anyway, while I was doing this work, uh, the attention of some other scientists led by Peter Vogt was focused on this high amplitude magnetic anomaly zone near the Galapagos. And these were geochemists and geophysicists working on it. And Peter uh, had collected a bunch of uh, new magnetic anomaly data in this area. He was kind enough to wait till I finished my PhD before he offered it to me to work on. And uh, then he gave me these, uh, uh, these anomalies. Once again, to help your eye correlate, I've uh, 
put north to the, to the left. This is the tip of the high amplitude zone. The high amplitude anomalies, the correlations are shown in blue. The normal amplitude anomalies are shown in red. Notice that the, uh, the blue correlations have a different azimuth than the red correlations. So I started working on these anomalies. And this was that previous uh, jump that I showed you. And then looking at these anomalies, it looked to me like more jumps were occurring. So I analyzed these and found uh, uh, these uh, ridge jumps, where the new axis is shown in bold and black. The star shows the uh, fail drift axis. And you can see very nice fits to the anomalies. This turned out to be the key profile. Because you have half of the axial anomaly here, half of the axial anomaly over here. In between, there's reverse lithosphere. You cannot do this with any kind of asymmetric spreading. This has to be a discontinuous jump. And the most interesting thing about these jumps after these models were, were made was the pattern in which they occurred. Every successive jump was slightly younger and slightly longer than the preceding jump. So I sat down to try to figure out what kind of pattern this implied, and this, this is what was implied. This is the discontinuous propagating rift model. You have a ridge transform ridge system. You spread the blue lithosphere in this same geometry. So you form a fracture zone at the transform, and then you instantly propagate this this far. This leaves behind a fossil fracture zone on each side, fossil transform fault, fossil ridge, or, or fail rift. This process repeats in a systematic uh, manner, spread some lithos lithosphere, create new lithosphere, propagate, spread, propagate, and you're left with a pattern like this, with an on echelon pattern of uh, fossil fracture zones, failed transforms, and failed rifts uh, left behind in the wake of this propagating rift. This is the propagating rift. This is the one that's growing longer in place. This one uh, fails. So then we considered what would happen if this process were continuous. The shorter that you sit here spreading on a transform, the shorter the time you have to form a fracture zone. In the limit, as this becomes a continuous process, that transform only exists instantaneously at any one place. The, thus, you don't form a fracture zone. These two lines uh, condense into one, extending away from the tip of the propagating rift. Similarly, the, the uh, fossil transforms shrink to zero length, the fracture zone zero length, and the failed rifts become a continuous pattern extending away. And this is what that pattern looks like for continuous propagation. So I worked out this pattern and I realized I was looking at the Juan de Fuca area. And that's the explanation for these uh, offsets in the magnetic anomalies. Their offsets. They offset the magnetic anomalies, but there has never been any relative plate motion. Instead, these, these lines are the low side of the uh, propagating rift tip relative to the, to the plate. And these, thus, they're not faults. They've never been faults. And that's why I call them pseudo faults uh, in this area. So here I just solved one Fuca, and I waited for a, an adoring world to uh, shower me with praise. And, and I think it's fair to say the idea was pretty much ignored. And uh, so I, I was curious. I didn't know why, because you know, this was an important problem, and it was a simple modification of plate tectonic theory, and it worked very well. I finally decided it was because uh, people just weren't able to understand how uh, something like this develops when the plate tectonic geometry is changing with time. And so that's when we started making computer graphics animation movies, and hopefully this will now uh, show you how the Juan de Fuca area uh, developed. I started doing these at Hawaii. Uh, do I click it? Or, uh, this is a computer graphics animation movie of the seafloor spreading yeah. history of the Juan de Fuca area in the Northeast Pacific. In the form of a sequence of predicted isochron patterns calculated at small successive time increments and as a Mercator representation of seafloor spreading on a sphere, we made it in order to show how propagating rifts produce changes in plate boundary geometry. The model starts 30 million years ago. There's a clock in millions of years before present in the lower left, and the first five million years show seafloor spreading geometry without rift propagation. The heavy red vertical lines are seafloor spreading centers connected by a horizontal transform fault. The inactive transform fault extensions are called fracture zones. Spreading is always parallel to the transform faults. Isochrons of new seafloor are formed at the spreading centers every two million years and then carried away by seafloor spreading. Twenty-five million years ago, this plate boundary geometry changed as the northern spreading center began propagating to the south. 
According to the propagating rift hypothesis, one spreading center grows longer, propagates, while the other fails or dies. This caused the termination of one of the great Pacific fracture zones, the Sela fracture zone, because fracture zones only form non-propagating spreading center transform fault intersections. Propagators instead form V-shaped patterns of offsets we call pseudo-faults because they look like faults, although no relative plate motion has ever occurred along them. Instead, they mark the loci of pants positions of propagator tips. Pseudo-faults are always V-shaped and point in the direction of propagation. The hooked oblique isochron pattern extending to the upper right was the most difficult to understand before we made this movie. It shows transferred lithosphere and failed rifts formed as the propagator produces time transgressive transfer of lithosphere from one plate to the other, in this case from the Pacific plate to the Juan de Fuca plate off Oregon and Washington. The isochrons disappear off the screen to the right, similar to the way in which the real ones on the seafloor are subducted beneath North America, the process which produces volcanism in the Cascades such as Mount St. Helens. All angles are functions of the ratio of propagation rate to spreading rate. The change that just occurred shows a speeding up of propagation. Also, two smaller propagators were initiated that propagated south behind the first one. All through this period, seafloor spreading has been east-west, parallel to the transform fall. Five million years ago, the direction changed to northwest-southeast. The first propagator stopped, and the present Blanco transform fault geometry developed. A northward propagator was initiated, and the small south propagators hit the Blanco and stopped. This very complicated pattern results from a small, simple conceptual modification of plate tectonic theory, but a very satisfying one because it explains so much in a simple way. In particular, rift propagation explains areas such as Juan de Fuca that even the discoverers of plate tectonics thought were too complex for plate tectonics to explain. Rift propagation appears to be the primary mechanism by which reorganizations of the Earth's extensional plate boundaries are accomplished. So I took this movie to a conference, and uh, there were a lot of competing ideas in this area, of course. Uh, it was a, a classic area. They were all sitting in the front row with their arms folded. I showed the first version of this movie, and at the end, they all agreed this is what's going on in the Juan de Fuca area. So that computer graphics animation is... Uh, very good, and uh, Alstis, uh, we, we're all looking forward to your movie of uh, the Reykjanes Ridge evolution. Uh, you'll come up with this part of your work. So uh, this is now the ultimate. Uh, Doug Wilson took this uh, to, the, to the limit in Juan de Fuca. There's some other anomalies that he's added. These are what the anomalies look like. And this was his uh, summary model. And when you compare the model to the observed, you get a very nice fit. So there's just no doubt this is going on in the Juan de Fuca area today. Uh, so there is now a change in plate tectonic geometry. Outside of this uh, uh, trapezoid outlined in green, classic plate tectonic geometry is just the same as it ever was. Inside the trapezoid, things are different. You now have a pseudo fault, another pseudo fault, this transferred lithosphere with these uh, peculiar patterns. I'm going to show you a little more that these, this predicted pattern actually exists and then the failed rift. So inside that, that's what propagating rifts have, that's the change in plate tectonic geometry. And now we know why ridges jump. We've been fooled into thinking that the important thing going on is this big lateral shift where the ridge is here and suddenly there's this big lateral shift uh, here, this big discontinuous shift in the, in the y direction, and that does happen, but the, the cause is a tiny incremental growth in the x direction of this new crack breaking through the plate. When it intersects the plane of the profile, suddenly it looks to you like there's this, been this big lateral shift of the ridge, but in fact it's just the crack happens to hit the plane of your profile, and that's what causes the, the ridge jumps. Uh, all of these uh, uh, angles and patterns are predictable uh, given the initial geometry and the ratio of prop propagation rate to spreading rate. You can calculate uh, everything on, that you see on this diagram. Uh, you can then uh, compare the predicted pattern to the observed and you get a very nice fits. Uh, in, in reality, what you do is you calculate the spreading rate from the magnetic anomalies and then you use the pseudo faults and the failed rifts to uh, calculate the propagation, propagation rate. Now, this geometry is predictable, assuming that this is an instantaneous transform fault. But when you think about what an instantaneous transform fault is, 
if this rift propagates continuously, this transform has to be continually slicing uh, this lithosphere up like a cheese slicer on a very fine scale. And it seemed to us, us being uh, Fred Dunham here, Jason Morgan and I, that uh, the Earth wouldn't go to this kind of uh, trouble. And in fact, maybe instead of having an instantaneous transform fault, there would be a zone of distributed shear deformation as the uh, spreading rate has to go from zero on the propagate, propagating rift to the full rate over some finite time and distance, and it must uh, die on the, the dying rift at, at some, uh, from the full rate down to zero. And so we hypothesized this, uh, and, but we pointed out, this was in 1983, years before overlapping spreading centers were discovered, we pointed out that if they should exist, they had to propagate to be stable, because otherwise the spreading that's left over uh, changes the orientation of these ridge axes and the propagator can't grow in a straight line. And so given a geometry like this, it can be stable instantaneously, but an uh, uh, overlapper can only be stable if it's propagating. And for the propagating rift to grow in a constant azimuth, the tip had to curve toward the dying rift. This then was the active shearing zone and uh, the predicted uh, structures left behind in the wake of the propagating rift. This model has been uh, really amazingly good through the years. The one thing that we missed was the dying rift curves toward the propagating rift as, as well in these uh, overlap zones. But other than that, everything here has been very good. We've been to the Galapagos area with uh, every geophysical tool known. The first one was uh, Gloria. This is from a survey by Roger Searle, and he saw the predicted V-shaped pattern. And you can see some of the structures curving around like we predicted in this zone. Is to think about what happens. Uh, it's something like an abyssal hill lineament comes in with one shape, and it comes out with a different shape. So there's deformation that goes on in this zone, uh, and you can calculate this deformation, and uh, this is what we find. We, uh, it turns out that deformation is uh, accomplished by bookshelf faulting. This is uh, one of my students, Marty Kleinrock, did a lot of work on this, where right lateral transform zone shear is accommodated by left lateral uh, bookshelf faulting. And this, uh, similar to what's seen in Iceland in the South Iceland seismic zone, this is how the uh, shear gets accommodated in this zone of transferred lithosphere. So we went there with uh, CMARC 2 and Deep Toe. The most useful data set was C-Beam. And here you can see this is, uh, this is the propagating rift. There's the outer pseudofault. The inner pseudofault is harder to see because it abuts this zone of deformation. And you can see that the pre-existing abyssal hill fabric comes into this zone, and then it gets sheared into this oblique structure as it comes out. This is, was incompatible with previous plate tectonic theory. It's predicted by the propagating rift hypothesis, and so uh, this is an, another reason that the propagating rifts are generally accepted. My students and I spent many person years trying to figure out exactly what was going on in this area, because there's obviously some very interesting structural geology going on. And finally, I sent this data set to Dan McKenzie and said, this is what the area looks like to see me, and what does it look like to you? Practically by return mail, Dan said, this is what it looked like to him. <laughs> uh, but he was also kind enough to draw me a diagram, and it looks a lot like that, that figure that we had published in, uh, in 1980, with, with uh, some exceptions down here with the dying rift, with some complexities that we weren't really thinking of because we were so focused on the, uh, on the propagating rift. Uh, the, the, the fact that deformation is distributed in this area is shown by Fred Dunamere's OBS array. These are the patterns of earthquakes uh, uh, he, he and his students uh, uh, discovered. Once again, distributed deformation within this zone. We dove in it with Alvin. If you do tectonics, you dive with Alvin, you dive on a lot of talus in this zone. Two dives, we didn't see a single intact pillow. That's how pervasively deformed this area is. This is, once again, zone of transfer of lithosphere. That's this zone where the lithosphere transfer happens. This is our summary interpretation. The rift propagation is bounded by the pseudo-faults. Uh, this, this, the, the propagating spreading center follows behind. This is Marty Kleinrock's PhD work, where the spreading center actually curves down here. And uh, Jerry Schubert and I, Schubert's the one who realized it, uh, that if you crack here and it takes a while to come to a steady state ridge, uh, you can uh, calculate the viscosity of the mantle. We calculated viscosities of 10 to the 18th, 10 to the 19th pascal seconds. At the time, that seemed low, but I think those are pretty much accepted uh, kinds of numbers uh, today. So this is our summary interpretation in the Galapagos. And you can see the successive steps. 
the discontinuous propagation, continuous propagation, and then the broad transform zone uh, geometry. Interestingly, in the Galapagos, uh, the, the final answer is sort of a combination of this and this, because the propagator propagates continuously. The failed rifts die in those on inch line problems that I showed you. These things have petrologic effects, mostly worked out by uh, John Sinton and Dave Christie, uh, where there's uh, enrichment in titanomagnetite. There's enhanced fractionation in propagating rift tips. This is seen all over the world. This is from uh, uh, John's Galapagos dredging program. That same pattern that we see at 95 West is seen at other propagators. These other propagators come from a, a detailed study uh, Doug Wilson and I did. And uh, these are Doug's fits to the magnetic anomalies. You can see here the magnetic fit is good. Out here, uh, there's something wrong. You've got too much lithosphere on this plate. And as it turns out, uh, not enough over here. So we modeled this with uh, our magnetic anomaly modeling program to put in a failed rift, and this amount of lithosphere has been transferred from this plate to this plate, and now we get a good fit of the old anomalies as well as the young anomalies. And the pattern of these jumps uh, is, is what are shown by these other propagators, all propagating away from the Galapagos hotspot. This is a common theme. We see this all over the world. Rifts propagate away from hotspots. So in my original PhD work, all of these ridge jumps I was finding back to the Galapagos hotspot are accomplished by propagators that initiate at the hotspot and then move away in both directions. And uh, so these are the summary tectonics uh, uh, Doug Wilson came up with. And here is the pattern of the spreading center jumps that he calculated. And it wasn't until I started looking at uh, working on Iceland uh, recently that it occurred to me that these things occur in sort of uh, periodic patterns. And so I wondered, could the Galapagos plume be pulsing like people claim the Iceland plume is pulsing? I don't know. I mean, this is just something that uh, I'm just starting to think about. Anyway, here's the pattern. They propagate away from the hot spot. Why did they do this? Uh, the best theory is from Phipps Morgan department here, I think, uh, following a, a, a suggestion that rifts propagate downhill. Uh, there's tensile stress because you have excess uh, bathymetry, high shallower bathymetry at the Galapagos hotspot. You get gravity spreading stresses, and this causes cracks to propagate away from uh, uh, tensile stress. You have to have a resistive force because there's no runaway accelerations on Earth. They proposed that the resistive force was viscous suction of these tip depressions that I hope I pointed out when we were looking at the Galapagos sea beam. There's always a depression at the tip of these propagators for the intermediate spreading. Recently, another uh, proposal for another uh, resistive force was from uh, Jacqueline Floyd, and she said that perhaps there's um, process zone deformation and microcracking out in front, and that's what limits the velocity of this propagation. She was working on actually another kind of propagator. She was working at Hess Deep. Uh, there's a triple junction out here that you can't really see. Here's the 95 West propagator that uh, you, you, you can see at this guy. I just grabbed this from the, the Dave Sandwell's uh, uh, website. Uh, this rift has to propagate in order to stay at the triple junction. You can convince yourself, I did in my PhD work, that at a three ridge triple junction, the ridges have to grow longer. And as this ridge grows longer, it has to propagate, it's growing longer, just to stay at the triple junction. It's actually a different kind of uh, propagation. Now, here's a diagram with no scale on it. I've showed you that this is pervasively deforming at the Galapagos scales, 15 to 20 kilometers. What if the scale becomes so big that you can't deform it pervasively anymore? What would happen then? Well, what happens is you get Easter microplate tectonics. And as it turns out, Easter Island was formed at the tip of a propagating rift uh, long ago. This is what the Easter microplate looks like. This was our initial survey. The microplate uh, was certainly thought to be behaving mostly rigidly because the earthquakes are concentrated along what turned out to be the plate boundaries that we identified in our initial sea beam survey back in 1983. And as part of the survey, we found some structures on the interior of the microplate that looked like deformation. They looked like propagating rift uh, deformation. Here's, whoops. This is uh, Dave Nars. Uh, he, this, David Nars, another of my students, did his PhD work here. Here you can see this is a pseudo fault that extends from the northern tip of the microplate all the way back to Easter Island. That's how we know Easter Island formed a propagated rift tip. Uh, 
and the structures on the microplate were shown by a survey by Roger Searle, a glorious survey, and he found these deformed structures on the interior of the microplate. Now, two of the most interesting areas are up here. Uh, this is pedo deep, and down here, the southwest rift. The reason Roger didn't cover them, and it's, it's too bad, actually, because this would have been a nicer diagram, was that we'd been there earlier with CMARC-2. And for example, this is the, the pedo deep area. You can see a series of propagators have come up. They're gradually bending around as age-driven microplate tectonics is beginning. And you can see the abyssal hill fabric here. This is a side scan, CMARC-2 side scan. It comes into this area, and by the time it comes out, it's been sheared into this trend over here, here with the uh, east-west. Uh, there's been a lot of subsequent work in this area. We had a diving program uh, here uh, a couple of years ago, and uh, David uh, collected some more CV data. Once again, this is pedo deep, and these uh, scarps that we've been diving on, because it's a 4,000 uh, meter slice of ocean crust, uh, were formed as the rift propagates and breaks through this plate. Uh, the plate is rotating as an age-driven microplate, a concept that uh, Hans Schouten uh, uh, quantified. We, we had previously proposed, NAR and his PhD work, that there's right lateral shear here, and this would lead to clockwise rotation of this uh, chunk of lithosphere that's too big to pervasively deform. Han Schouten quantified that, and then Roger Searle drew a, a diagram of one possible uh, evolution of the microplate. But part of it is, is correct, part of it is oversimplified. Here's sort of the, the ultimate we've reached in the, the microplate. Once again, NARS PhD work. The microplate, a bunch of propagators. This pseudo fault I should have showed you on uh, Roger's glorious survey. It comes right into Easter Island. And this wedge of uh, deformed lithosphere up here, we still don't fully understand, but some enterprising structural geologists will jump on this at some point and, uh, and, and explain this very complicated area. Uh, you can see some of these things from space. Here's the Easter microplate. You can see some of the pseudo faults. There's another microplate down here, Juan Fernandez, with a remarkably similar geometry. You can see some paleo microplates as the East Pacific rise is propagated. Uh, to the north, and there's an area down in here where there's some kind of a ridge offset that we wanted to study long before Samuel and Smith made it possible to see these things. Uh, so we went down to survey because we thought this is going to be the world's fastest slipping transform, because this is, this is where the Earth's fastest sea force spreading rates exist, 150 kilometers per billion years. Instead, we found something more interesting than the fastest sloping transform. We found a giant overlap structure. This is about 120 by 120 kilometers. This ridge is propagating to the south. This ridge is the dying ridge. It's being beaten back. It used to be up here. Now it only extends up this far. But instead of just dying, going gently into that good night, occasionally it throws a, a little dueling propagator up to the north. We know this because we took glorious side scan data down. And these are the these, uh, reflective stuff is younger than the surrounding seafloor. Black here is young. Uh, here's the overlap zone today. And here are these previous failed rifts that you can see uh, uh, propagated up. Dueling propagation, I forgot to acknowledge uh, the work of uh, the University of Washington guys in Juan de Fuca, uh, H. Paul Johnson, and, and others have proposed dueling propagation up there. Uh, here's the uh, model, uh, Jim Coronado did his master's thesis uh, in this area, and here was the model that he ultimately came up with of uh, dueling, dueling propagation in this area. Presently, there's this giant overlap zone. What's going on in that overlap zone today? Well, the earthquake pattern, this is from Laura Wetzel's work, shows that there's distributed earthquakes in this zone, and that these earthquakes are consistent with warp shell faulting. So the deformed structures you see here look like they're uh, caught in this deformed zone between uh, dueling propagating rifts. However, not very long ago, there was uh, an attempt to form a southern boundary. So we hypothesized that maybe this is how the deformed structures in the microplate interiors form, and that this is how microplates form, as these giant overlappers become too big to deform anymore, and they begin to rotate as uh, uh, mostly rigid microplates. So we think this is about the scale that this is uh, happening. Uh, Acton and others had proposed that this transition from shear to rigid occurred at about uh, a million square kilometers. We think uh, it's much smaller than that. We think it's uh, about the scale of 29 south or AFAR, below the scale of Juan Fernandez. 
uh, maybe uh, 15 to 20,000 square kilometers, this lithosphere becomes too big to pervasively deform anymore. At least at these spreading rates. And remember, these are the fastest on Earth, so uh, they'd be thin and, uh, and weak. Well, what's the propagating rift uh, hydrothermal pattern? The question came up because people had proposed uh, there were uh, times of intense mineralization you find in sedimentary deposits, and they said these are times of big ridge reorganizations. This is how ridges reorganize. Uh, Ed Baker and I organized an uh, expedition to look at the hydrothermal pattern of uh, this area between the Eastern and Juan Fernandez microplates. Uh, super active hydrothermal activity everywhere except the tips of these propagators, which are the least hydrothermally active areas uh, known uh, in the world oceans. So, uh, once again, uh, if you're in tectonics, you dive on talus, but these people need our maps. I don't want to discourage anyone from going into tectonics. You still get an opportunity to go to areas like this. What about continental breakup? Well, rifts are propagating through continents, too. The Gulf of Aden is propagating into uh, Djibouti. The Red Sea is propagating south into the Danakil region. Uh, this is some work of uh, Isabel Managhetti, uh, Taponier of Cordio where they find dueling propagation. The Red Sea propagator comes into the area, the Aden propagator comes in, they overlap, it causes this uh, clockwise rotation and bookshelf faulting. It looks like this is deforming today. Uh, some people think there's a microplate going on already. This is probably about the scale uh, dueling propagators turn to microplates. What about even large scale, larger scale propagation? Well, continents break up by propagating rifts as well. This is a model from Greg Fink. And he shows that if you extend a continent, the rifting starts before the propagating sea floor spreading center follows, just as we've seen in the oceans. And so by the time the propagating spreading center comes up here, now you're forming sea floor and you're forming isochrons, you have a bunch of rifted and stretched continental lithosphere up there. So later, when you take your isochron pattern, and once again, these things are pseudo faults because they, they bound progressively young, uh, younger and longer isochrons. When you close it up, based on those isochrons, you close it down here, you get overlap of the continent up here. This means that the continental reconstructions by Teddy Bullard and, and others, which were influential in, in convincing people that continental drift had occurred, are wrong. Bullard uh, minimized the total amount of overlap and gap, and they showed that the way you do it, but, you, but if you look at the pattern, all of the gap is down here, and the overlap increases up to the north. Vink's model, which is now accepted, you close up the gap completely, you let the overlap increase, that shows the direction of propagation. So there was a propagating rift that broke apart South America and Africa, and it was propagating to the north. What about California? <laughs> well, uh, I'm going to go through this very briefly because I'm, 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 it's clear I'm never going to get funded to do any more work, so I want to pass this on to the younger generation. <laughs> Uh, there were a lot of propagators offshore California, and I should point out that we think that these are not propagating away from hot spots, they're not propagating downhill, we think it's because of subduction-related stresses. As the age pattern of the subducted uh, slab changes, we all know slab pull is an important part of the driving mechanism. The ridges want to reorient, propagation is how the ridges reorient. But it turns out that at least one and maybe two propagators actually reach this continental margin. The, so uh, I came up with this theory back in uh, 1983. It was based on a single data point that Peter Lonsdale later showed to be an artifact. But, uh, but I liked the idea, nevertheless. And in fact, Lonsdale uh, then pursued the idea and came up with an even better propagator that uh, hit the continental margin at exactly the time and place the Gulf of California began to open. So all of us, everybody who comes up with a new idea, anyone in this class who comes up with a new idea, will try to apply this to the Gulf of California. Uh, we did it too, and uh, the Gulf of California opened as a propagator hit the continental margin. It turns out all of the other propagators were eliminated in various ways and never reached the continental margin. Some turned into uh, fracture zones, some turned into uh, microplates. There's just one other propagator that might have reached the continental margin. There's a data uh, complexity in here that you just can't understand. Turns out, if this reached the continental margin, it would be exactly the time and place that the transverse range rotation began to form. And so uh, there are, uh, were, are some other explanations, but these other explanations fail to take into account that this microplate 
is, is not special. They argue that it's special for some reason, and yet there are all these other microplates with the same geometry, and all of the explanations other people have proposed should apply to those other microplates, and they, you can't argue that the transverse ranges is unique. You should say this is happening in other areas where there were other microplates with exactly the same geometry, whether it's push on a, uh, on a fracture zone, pull on the ridge. But it turns out there is one unique uh, thing going on in this area, and I ought to have this uh, flashing brightly to let you know, that there's a well propagating rift wake. And so this, this model I proposed long ago is that this rift, which for millions of years has been propagating through the Pacific plate, through the, I'm sorry, through the Farallon plate, transferring lithosphere to the Pacific plate, which then moves north with the Pacific plate, might have continued down the subducting slab for a, a period of time, transferring lithosphere to the Pacific plate, which is now this is transferring subducted lithosphere. If this moves from the Pacific plate, there's basal drag on the overriding continent. Uh, Dave Bercovici uh, did some equations to show that this was, uh, would be sufficient to tear off a piece of the continent. And so uh, there looked like there were only two propagators ever hit the continental margin at exactly the time and places that the two most uh, anomalous tectonic things happened on the continental margin. So I, I think it's promising that uh, this is so political, you just can't get funded. Other people have competing models. Uh, and just uh, here's what we're working on today. This will be, uh, Alstice will be doing it for a PhD work. It turns out these V-shaped ridges extending south from Iceland uh, are propagating rift wakes. You can identify small ridge jumps uh, in this area. They're not symmetric, uh, as you've been led to believe. It's not symmetric seafloor spreading, in fact. Uh, it's rift propagation. I'm going to be giving another talk on that in a, in a week or two, so I'm not going into that uh, at all. So just in summary, uh, rift propagation is the mechanism that uh, uh, changes the geometry of seafloor spreading centers on Earth. Uh, they occur over a wide range of scales, overlappers, microplates, continental breakup, various driving mechanisms. Some propagate away from hot spots, some are because of subduction stresses, some propagate just to stay in a plate boundary. I forgot in the microplate work that as, as a microplate rotates, those rifts have to uh, propagate just to stay at the pole of rotation, just to stay there. So if there's different kinds of propagation, different scales, different driving mechanisms, but it's how the Earth uh, reorganizes the accretionary plate boundaries. Thank you.